Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome to our worship service this morning. Our scripture for today comes from 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1 to 7. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1 to 7. Let's hear the word of the Lord. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. When they see your respectful and pure conduct, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear. But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you are her children, if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as a weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Author John Trent shared this story when he was working as a youth worker in a summer camp. During summer camp, I did my best to round up kids who really I felt needed to hear about Jesus, who really needed Jesus in their life. I would invite them to camp, and there was one specific teenager named Mark. Mark was not very enthusiastic to attend this camp. Now, the main speaker for that summer camp was a man by the name of Bob Mitchell, or people call him Mitch. But he was also in charge of many logistic things for the camp. Therefore, Mitch would often be in conversation with the cook. The cook loved her work, but it was exhausting. She always looked tired. Whenever she talked to Mitch, he would get up and he would give up his chair for her to give her a moment's rest while they discuss meal plans for the week. This was a small gesture of kindness. No one noticed Mitch doing this, except for this young man named Mark. Mark hadn't come to the camp to hear about Jesus. He just wanted to have fun. But when he saw Jesus' love lived out in that simple act of kindness by the camp speaker, he began to listen to his talks. And later that week, Mark asked Jesus to come into his life, to come into his heart. Mark said this, It wasn't because of the messages, but because of the love he saw in Mitch. Mark said, If that's what it means to be a Christian, I want to be one. Our theme for the year is based on 1 Peter. And the theme the title is Living Faithfully in These Last Days. As followers of Jesus, how do we honor God? How do we live lives that honor God in this world as we wait for Jesus to return? Now, there are three main reasons why Peter calls Christians to live a godly life in the midst of the secular society that they find themselves in. And it's based on 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12. It says, Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you, as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. So in summary, Peter says there are actually three reasons why we are to live exceptional lives in front of the world. First is to honor God, to glorify God. Second is to honor God in the society that we live in, live such good lives among the Gentiles. And third is to win others over to Christ so that they may see your good deeds and glorify God, to honor God, to honor God in our society, and to win others to Christ. Now, in our passage today in 1 Peter chapter 3, it's talking about honoring God, not just in society, but within our homes, in our marriages. How can a husband and a wife honor God in how they live so that they are a faithful witness, a godly witness to the people around them. You might be listening to this message today, and maybe you're not married. But 
What we talked about today can also apply to any of our relationships. Or it maybe it can apply to a future relationship. So first, Peter addresses the wife, the woman. What does Peter say to her? Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. It says this, Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands. Submit to your husband. Submit to your husband. Now, that word submit, some of us might feel allergic when we see, when we hear this word. This word makes us feel uncomfortable because we have negative connotations of this word. Some, some people, we don't like this word, perhaps because we've encountered situations of abuse of power. And so this word has negative connotations. Perhaps another word we could use is how we honor our husbands. We honor our husbands. So, but when the Bible talks about be subject or submit, it refers to submitting out of reverence for Christ. Submitting out of reverence for Christ. In a sense, we all submit in different ways. We submit to the law of the land. We submit to leaders. So, for example, uh, this morning, when we were going to church, and many of the traffic lights were not working because of yesterday's storm, we had to submit to the traffic rules. If the traffic lights were not on, it's supposed to be considered a four-way stop. So coming to church this morning was an adventure because there were some people who were not stopping in the intersection. If people were not listening to the, uh, the rules, then it will be anarchy. It will be chaos. So, in a sense, the word submit simply means to come under someone's leadership or to come under obeying a certain rule. But when a husband asks a wife to do something that is contrary to God's word, then at that point, we must obey God rather than men. And again, sub submission doesn't mean that she doesn't have a voice, that she cannot speak up, that she cannot give her opinion. But rather, we see in Proverbs chapter 31, the competent mother, the competent wife. And she is resourceful, and she leads her family, she leads her household, and it is an orderly home. Let me also give you the cultural context of the Greco-Roman world. The ancient Greco-Roman culture was concerned about an orderly society. and many. Philosophers, Greek philosophers, secular philo philosophers, believe that in order for us to have an orderly society, we must, it must start with orderly homes. So submitting to someone's leadership in the home is expected in households. This also means that in that ancient culture, that the whole household was expected to worship the same gods. Let me share with you a quote from a non-Christian perspective from a Greek historian named Plutarch. He said, A wife should not acquire her own friends, but should make her husband's friends her own. This is from a non-Christian perspective. The gods are the first and most significant friends. For this reason, it is proper for a wife to recognize only those gods whom her husband worships. So what is he saying? That families in that culture were expected to worship the same gods and have the same circle of friends. Now imagine with me for a moment that say a woman becomes a Christian, becomes a follower of Jesus. Can you imagine how shocking, how countercultural, how um, even scandalous this would be? Not only does she become a worshiper of Jesus, but what if she worships Jesus exclusively? What if she worships Jesus only? And she chooses no longer to worship her husband, her household gods. Maybe if she worshiped Jesus, but she continued to worship other gods, it would not cause such a stir. But what if she chooses to abandon all her family's gods and only worship Jesus only? Christ alone gives her allegiance to Christ only. That would cause big trouble. Karen Jobes, a Bible commentator in 1 Peter, said this, 
the husband and society would perceive the wife's worship of Jesus as rebellion. As rebellion. Especially if she worshiped Christ exclusively. If the wife persists in her new Christian faith to the extent that others outside the household learn about it, the husband would also feel embarrassment and suffer criticism for not properly managing his household. Dr. Jobs also said this, The wife's attendance at Christian worship would provide the opportunity for her to have fellowship with other Christians who possibly were not her husband's friends. Depending on the specifics of social expectations, a wife's conversion to Christ could potentially have far-reaching implications for her husband and family. Do you see that for a woman in that culture who starts to worship Jesus only and abandon, uh, forsake her family gods, stop, no longer worship the family gods, do you see how big a deal this is? This is not a simple situation. So what is Peter's advice for the woman who becomes a Christian? But her husband is still an unbeliever. What does Peter encourage her to do? And this is Peter's words. How do you evangelize? How do you reach your husband with the gospel? In a sense, he's saying, do not despise your husband. Do not reject your husband. Do not cause trouble at home. Do not be argumentative. Don't make your home a hostile environment. But instead, Peter reinforces the idea that as she abandons her former pagan life, yet she is to continue to be committed to her husband, to love her husband, to submit to her husband, even if he is an unbeliever. That's why he says in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, that means that they are not Christians. They may be one without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Now that you're a Christian, instead of rejecting your unbelieving husband, instead of distancing yourself from him, instead you are to recommit to love him, to serve your family, to submit to him. You don't have a hostile or argumentative spirit. So that if they don't obey the word, they may be won without a word, not be won by your words, but by your respectful and gentle spirit, by your respectful and pure conduct. Let's review the reasons why Peter tells them to live this kind of life. Three reasons. First, to honor God. Second, to honor God in the society. That means in their home. And thirdly, to win others hopefully to win their husband to Christ. And that's why Peter calls the wife to submit even more, to love, to respect her husband, to honor her husband even more. But there is also a more theological reason for this. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22, Paul says, Wives, submit to yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Well, the Bible says submit for two reasons. You do it to the Lord, out of reverence for Christ. And second, God gave him the leadership responsibility. Pastor Tim Keller says that actually Jesus is the model for both the husband and the wife. And how the husband is to treat his wife And how the wife is to honor her husband. How is Jesus the model? How is Jesus like the husband? How is Jesus like the groom? Well, Jesus Christ loved the church that he gave up himself up for her. To cleanse her. To purify her. So that means that even though husbands are given this God-given leadership role, it's not an authoritarian leadership but it's a humble leadership. It is a servant leadership, not looking out for his own good mainly, but for the good of his family, for the well-being of his family. So husbands are called to imitate Christ in the way he husbands the church, in the way he loves the church. And that is the kind of Christian leadership that we are to imitate. Now, 
Jesus is also the model for the wife in terms of honoring, in terms of submitting. How is that? Well, we know the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit is equal in essence. Yet, the God the Son, Jesus, chooses to submit Himself to the Father. The Son obeys the Father because He loves the Father in John 14 verse 31. Submitting doesn't mean that the wife is inferior to the husband. God made them equal. They are equal in nature. They're equal in essence. God gave them, but God gave them complementary roles in the home. We remember Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, which says, There's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, there's no male and female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. You are equal in Christ. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, says that God created mankind in His own image. In the image of God, He created them. Male and female, He created them. That means both male and female, husband and wife, are both created in God's image. They are equal in essence, yet different in their role, in their function. They are complementary. Both men and women are made in God's image. Listen to the next thing that Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 3, chapter 3 verse 3 to 4. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. Now, this is not saying that we should not um, try to have a good presentation outwardly, but what this is saying is that we shouldn't spend an inordinate amount of time in the washroom. We shouldn't idolize the way we look on the outside. Human beings look on the outward appearance, but God looks in the heart. So, dear friends, I want to ask you this question. Do we spend more time in the washroom or do we spend more time in the prayer closet? Do we spend more time in the washroom trying to fix our hair to look good on the outside? Or do we rather spend more quality time in the prayer closet, spending time in God's Word, in prayer, in communing with God? And this is not just for women. This is both for men and women. And he said that we should rather focus on our inner and our heart in the gentleness and quiet spirit. Please note, brothers and sisters, that this is not just for the woman. This is not just for the wife. But all Christians are called to have a gentle and quiet spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, self-control. And Jesus said this in Matthew 11, verse 29. Come to me, all you are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. Jesus himself is gentle and humble in heart and meek, and he calls us to follow him, follow his example, to be like Christ in a kind way, to be gentle towards the body of believers, towards people in our neighborhood, and also to those in our family. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. God said to the prophet Samuel, The Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. God looks at the heart. So here's the application, brothers and sisters. Are we preoccupied? Do we spend too much time? Do we idolize our outward appearance? Do we focus so much on this that we neglect our heart? God looks in the heart. Yes, human beings, human nature often looks at the outward appearance, the kind of car you drive, the kind of house that you live in, uh, how you look, the kind of clothes you wear. But God looks at the heart. Do we focus so much in the washroom? Spending time in the washroom? Or do we spend more time in the prayer closet communing with God? God looks at the heart. Let's read 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 4. 
But let your adorning be the hidden person, the hidden person of the heart, with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, by submitting to their own husbands. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Peter uses Sarah as a great example of a woman of faith, a woman who obeyed God, who loved her husband, who honored her husband. Now, what is it about Sarah that makes her a great example of a woman of faith? Well, let's think about it for a moment. Let's think about God's calling for Abraham. When God called Abraham to leave his father's home, he is leaving security. He is living, he's taking a huge risk. And God calls him out of his comfort zone to go to a land that he knows nothing about. Abraham is taking a big leap of faith and obedience. And God guides him step by step. God doesn't tell him specifically where he is going, his final destination. And Abraham lived in tents most of his life if not all his life. He did not have a permanent address. He had to keep moving from place to place to place. It was an unstable life, but God was with him. And Abraham believed God and obeyed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, where does Sarah come in? Imagine if you were Sarah. You are the wife of Abraham. And Abraham, imagine your husband comes up to you and says, we're going to uproot ourselves right now. We're going to leave our comfort zone. We're going to leave the security. We're going to go. And Sarah is saying, where are we going? We just have to go where God leads us. Sometimes we want stability. Sometimes we want security. Sometimes tell me where we're going. We need to plan. We need to prepare. We need to do all these things. For Sarah to take, to obey Abraham, to submit to Abraham's leadership as he obeys God, it takes her a great leap of faith to be courageous, to trust in God, to obey God. That's why Sarah is a great example of a woman of faith. She chooses to follow Abraham as he follows God, to believe in God and trust in God, even though her eyes do not see the end, the final destination. Dear friends, dear brothers and sisters, you may not see ultimately God's final destination for you. You're just following Him one step at a time. And sometimes as human beings, we want to see the end destination. Show me, God, where should I go to university? Show me, God, where should I be working? Show me, God, where, 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 do you, where are you planting me? But God says, I just want you to follow me step by step. Just walk with me. Trust in me. Honor me. So in summary, for the Christian women who are married perhaps to non-Christian husbands, Peter says, the way you honor God Yes, worship Christ alone, but do not despise your husbands, but rather love him, respect him, honor him, submit to him, so that if any of them do not obey the word, they may be one without a word, but by your conduct. You see Peter using a play on words. If they don't obey the word, they may be one without a word, but by your conduct, your pure, respectful gentle conduct. Karen Jobes says it this way, Peter affirms the wife's choice to leave her former pagan life while at the same time instructing her to remain faithful and committed within this most basic relationship. Now let's go to the husband. What is Peter's instruction for the husbands in how they treat their wives? Imagine if a man becomes a Christian And he tells his family, let's all get baptized. Now, some women genuinely come to saving faith in Christ. They genuinely want to in their heart. But some women, it's entirely possible that some women may may be baptized, may say, okay, I will follow your new religion. I will follow your Jesus. But maybe there is no personal encounter with Christ. And Peter says, husbands, how do you win over your spouse? How do you win over your wife to Christ? What does Peter say to them? 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Look with me. It says this. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives 
in an understanding way, showing honor, honor, honor to the woman as a weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. What does he mean? What does Peter mean when he says husbands to live in, with their wives in an understanding way? It means to be considerate towards them. Remember the context. Remember the cultural context in there that, that, that uh, Peter is speaking to. Many of the women did not have many privileges. They did not have many rights. Many women were looked down upon. But Peter is saying, you are to be different in the way you treat the women in your life. You are to be considerate towards them. You have to honor them. You have to show them love and kindness and compassion beyond what is expected of the culture that you find yourself in. And listen to what Peter says. And you honor them. Honor them. Husbands, let us honor our wives, the wife that God has given us. Honor means high respect. Esteem them highly. Proverbs chapter 31, verse 31 says, Honor her for all that her hands have done, and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. Husbands, do we honor the wife that God has given us? Do we honor her? Maybe we say, oh, I honor her. I tell her in private. You know, I always tell her I love her. How I tell her how beautiful she is. You know, I appreciate all she does. But to honor also means you let her works bring her praise. That means it's a public praise also. Sometimes, sometimes as husbands, we have this bad habit. Sometimes we, we joke too much and we make fun of our spouse in public. And, you know, it happens the other way too. Wives sometimes do this with their husbands too. But as followers of Jesus, we are called rather to honor them instead. Instead of putting down our spouses, we are called to lift them up, to esteem them highly. We need to convert the way we speak. If our heart has been transformed by Jesus Christ, we are to honor and respect our husband. We are called to honor and respect our wife. Proverbs 31, 31 says, Honor her for all that her hands have made. If we honor our wives in front of our kids, if we honor our husband, if you, wife, if you honor your husband in front of your kids, if we honor them, the more our children will respect their mom and dad. If you don't honor them in front of the children, and the more we see the opposite. But what does Peter mean when he says that they are the weaker vessel? He means weaker only in a sense of physical strength in relation to men. Not mentally, not emotionally, because many men are emotionally, um, you know, struggling, uh, struggling. But he means only physical strength. When Peter says to honor them, that also prohibits men from any kind of abuse, physical or verbal and so on. Christian husbands, now that we are followers of Jesus, we are called to honor our wife because they are co-heirs with you of the grace of life, meaning they are equal to you. They are loved by God. They are a person of worth. They experience the same grace that God has given you. God doesn't show favoritism. There's neither male nor female. You're all one in Christ. You're both equally valuable in the eyes of God. Do you see how countercultural the Christian message is to that culture? Karen Job says, we see a social transformation within the Christian community, allowing it to become an alternate society from the Greco-Roman society based on God's redemptive plan based on the gospel of Jesus Christ. So why should we honor our wives? Because they are co-heirs with us in the grace of life and also that our prayers may not be hindered. Do you know that we are accountable to God in how we treat our spouse? One time, some of the Israelite men were complaining to God, God, how come you do not accept our offering? How come you do not answer our prayer? And God says, because I am her protector. I am your judge. God says to them in Malachi chapter 2, verse 13, listen to what God says to the men of Israel. Another thing you do, you flood the Lord's altar with tears. You weep and wail because He no longer looks with favor on your offerings or accepts them with pleasure from your hands. How come God doesn't answer our offering? How come God doesn't hear our prayer? You ask why? 
And God says, it is because the Lord is the witness between you and the wife of your youth. You have been unfaithful to her, though she is your partner, your equal, the wife of your marriage covenant. She is who God has given you. And God is her protector. God is her refuge. And how we treat our wives, we are accountable to God. God calls us men to repent, that our prayers might be answered. So as a practical application, dear men, now that we are followers of Christ, we are now called also to treat our wives differently. We are called to honor them, to lift them up rather than to put them down. Husbands and wives, let's honor one another. Let's lift up our spouse rather than putting them down. Let's submit. Wives, submit to your husband. Respect them. Respect their leadership. And husbands, love your wives. Honor her. Treat her as your equal. In conclusion, our theme for this year is living faithfully in these last days. We are called to be godly witnesses, not just in our neighborhood, not just in our work, not just in our school, but also in our home and in our marriage. Honoring Christ in all our actions. As 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12 says this. If you can read this with me, let's read it together. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds, your gentle and quiet spirit, and glorify God on the day of visitation. And Jesus says in Matthew 5, 16, In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds, and glorify your Father in heaven. Let me end with this. Author James Dobson shares the story of his good friend, Dr. E.V. Hill, a minister in Mount Zion Baptist Church in L.A. Dr. Hill lost his precious wife, Jane, to cancer and describes her in her funeral as the classy lady who made him a better man. When E.V. Hill was a young man, he was struggling. He had trouble earning a living for his family. That led him to invest the family's savings over Jane's objections in the purchase of a service station. She felt her husband lacked the time and expertise to oversee this investment, which proved to be accurate. Eventually, the service station closed down and went broke. It was a critical time in the life of this young man. He had failed at something important. And his wife would have been justified in saying, I told you so. But Jane had an intuitive understanding of her husband's heart. Evie came home that night expecting his wife to to vent over his foolish investment. Instead, she sat down with him and said, I've been doing some figuring. I figure you don't smoke, you don't drink. If you, you, if you smoke and drank, we would have lost as much as you lost in the service station. So we received six in one hand. We lost six in one hand. So it's okay. We're, we're even. Let's forget about it. We're, we're fine. And he said, she could have shattered my confidence at that delicate juncture. The male ego is surprisingly fragile, especially during times of failure and embarrassment. That's why I needed to hear her say, I still believe in you. And that is precisely the message that she conveyed to me. And shortly after, Evie came home one night and found the house dark. When he opened the door, he saw that Jane had prepared a candlelight dinner for two. And he asked her, what do you mean by this? And Jane said, well... We're going to eat by candlelight tonight. Evie thought that was a great idea. He went into the bathroom to wash his hands. He turned on the switch, but there was no light. He felt his way into the bedroom to try to flip on another switch. Still, there was no light. Darkness prevailed. There was no electricity. The young man went back to the dining room and asked Jane why the electricity was off. And she began to cry. She said, you work so hard, and we are trying, but it's pretty rough. I didn't have quite enough money to pay for the electricity bill. I didn't want you to know about it, so I thought we would just eat by candlelight tonight. 
Dr. Hill described his wife's words with intense emotion. You know, she could have said to me, I've never been in this situation before. I was reared in the home of my father, and we never had our light cut off. She could have broken my spirit. She could have ruined me. She could have demoralized me. But instead, she said, somehow or another, we'll get these lights on. But let's eat tonight by candlelight. Let's not give up. Dear brothers and sisters, husbands and wives, followers of Jesus, let's honor one another in difficult times and in good times. Honoring one another even though it may not be easy. Let's honor God by honoring the people around us that they may see our good works and glorify God in the day of visitation. May we be like Christ in all our interactions with the world, that our actions would honor God, honor God in society, and win people to Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before your presence. And thank you so much for you are such a great and awesome God. Thank you for our humble King, our Lord Jesus, who emptied himself, who humbled himself, became obedient to death, even death on a cross. In order that we might have life in Christ, in order that our sins might be completely wiped away. Thank you so much for this grace that you have given us, for Christ submitting to the Father's will. May we also, in the way we interact with people, in the way we interact with people who do not know Christ, may we show Christ's love to them, may we honor, may we submit, may we respect, may we win people, not just with our words, but also even without our words, by our conduct, by our godly action. May we live a sacrificial life that you've called us to be. We praise you and we thank you. And this we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. And now, let's receive the benediction. May the love of God and the grace of the Lord Jesus and the presence of the Holy Spirit go with you now and forevermore. God bless you.